Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with If I Could Choose Only One Recording by Artist B, It Would Have to Be Work C. Well, Artist B is the great Czech conductor Carol Anschurl, and Work C was really, really difficult because there are many, many choices. I mean, the temptations are are manifold. First, there's all of the interesting Czech music he did, his championship of, of Martinu back in the day when he was not in good color with the authorities in communist Czechoslovakia. There's his unbelievable Shostakovich 10th Symphony on Deutsche Grammophon, which is still a reference recording for that work. There's, there's all of his other wonderful Czech music, both familiar and unfamiliar. Uh, his, the, the, amazing combination of of intensity and structural cohesion that he brought to just about everything he did. I'm thinking, for example, of, I mean, the Prokofiev Romeo and Juliet music, which is just wrist-slittingly powerful, or things that, that you ordinarily, the Dvorak Six, I mean, it's just, just a huge list of incredible, incredible performances with the Czech Philharmonic. I mean, that amazing orchestra, which was at its absolute peak during Antrell's tenure. And so I chose with great trepidation, but uh, a certain amount of confidence, Mahler 9. Here it is, his Mahler 9th. Uh, he only recorded Mahler symphonies 1 and 9. He didn't do any others. Uh, but this ninth is really, really, really special. First of all, the tempi generally, tempos are on the flowing side, on the swift side, especially the finale, which here is 23 minutes and 27 seconds. I mean, nowadays they can take up to half an hour. It's unbelievable. And the first movement is also a couple minutes quick. There is that, that constant sense of agitation underlying the music. It's not that it sounds fast, it doesn't. And it's not that he's slighting any of the more intense or powerful packages, the pa packages, passages. That's not happening either. It's just that the music has an, an urgency, almost a desperation about it, that's really in keeping with the nature of this particular piece. Now, in the second movement, you know, which is all gawky dance elements, you've got the amazing winds, of the Czech Philharmonic going dum, 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 dum. Oh, it's just wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And the Rondo Burlesca, the Rondo Burlesca is, is, how do I describe it? It's not the zippiest on disc, but it's the meanest. It really snaps and snarls and it goes to show really one of the most important lessons that we learn as we listen and gain experience, which, which is that that intensity doesn't always come from speed. Playing faster isn't always better. You know, I did a video recently about, you know, Earl Wilde's biography, and one of the points he makes when it comes to virtuoso music is that is that many players try and play it too fast. And in playing it so quickly, they skate over the surface of the music. They don't allow it the time to register, to develop its intensity, to shape the phrase, to communicate what the piece is all about. That's what happens in this Rondo Burlesque. It's really quite impressive because, because it sounds faster when it's emotionally more powerful. That is, it's more exciting because it because it because the emotion is hitting you. It, it, it keeps you tense on the edge of your seat. And so the impression you may have may not be of the zippiest thing you've ever heard in your life, but what you will get is what the music is expressing. And that's what you have here. It's, it's typical, actually, of the performance generally, but you really hear it in this version of the Rondo Burlesque. And then, and then we have the finale, the Adagio, which is, is wonderfully flowing and all the more powerful for not being, like, self-indulgently comatose. <laughs> Uh, you can play this music. I mean, I, there are performances that take 29 minutes, don't get me wrong, that I think are just fantab fantastic. There's like Levine and Philly and the last Bernstein and things like mean, that. You know, and, 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 and uh, what's his name? And yes, you know, Gary Bertini, pardon me. Bertini's, which is terribly slow. Really wonderful. And I, I don't have a problem with slow if it's well sustained. I mean, you know, it's, the devil is always in the details, right? But this performance has, again, that, that emotional pain, that intensity that I, really very few other performances have. You really get the sense that these, these people were, 
were, were living by the, you know, skin of their teeth or the, you know, the hanging on by a thread throughout most of this piece. And the urgency of the finale communicates itself in a way that only makes the final, the final ebbing away of life at the end all the more devastating. It's just an incredibly powerful performance. It's wonderfully played. It was very well recorded by Superfon. It was recorded in 1966. And really, it was just a special moment in the discography of the work, um, in the history of the work on disc, and in Anne Charles' discography as well. And so therefore, to appease the evil god Cancrozans, I'm giving him this and saying to him, you're not gonna tell me only one recording by this guy has any right to survive. Listen to this and tell me we don't have a right to hear the rest of what he achieved, because we do. And there's so much of it that's so good and so powerful um, for the same reasons, really for the same reasons. So if you haven't heard this, Valor Ninth, you really owe, you owe it to yourself to give it a shot and keep on listening, friends. Take care.